And so once again, from last week, just stepping in again is to look at some of the stories that might have gotten going in your mind. You might be looking at them right now. And I was asking you, just watch the stories and watch the sweeping judgments that happen. And can we again layer equanimity in as a choice, as an antidote? Can I reach for equanimity and put that in my toolbox and have that available in my toolbox instead of the other delusional things that I'm so used to wearing out those tools that aren't really beneficial and they don't get the job done. They don't really get the job done the way I'd like to get it done. So with equanimity and with the curiosity about the story, poking the story a little bit to ask, is it, is this the entire truth? Is this accurate, this story? And then as a result, having this non-judgmental, more loving awareness, more acceptance of whatever's arising in the mind. Anybody notice anything this week around that? Or anything right now that you're recalling? Did you get any stories going this week? Everything okay with your mind? Or did anything else happen? There's your doggy. Great to get some Dharma to the animals to at least let them listen a little bit at whatever level they, they hear it. Anybody want to comment? Everything good this week? Everything good, really? Um, not really. <laughs> right, I'm sure not really. Sarah, what's happening? Did you, were you able to catch any of the stories in the mind or when the on, imbalance happened? Um, I've had financial worries and I think it kind of makes me feel depressed because I feel, um, hopeless and I feel low self-esteem because I can't support myself without, I don't know, just... It goes on and on, but yeah. Sure, sure. So let, let's look at that a little bit. Thank you so much for bringing that up because that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today as well. I planted her there actually. Um, but what I'd like to do now that we're here, I wanna orient our motivation in a good way. I wanna orient our motivation. If you'd like to just close your eyes for a moment And allow the breath to deepen if you can. And just begin to bring your awareness to the breath as the respiration deepens. And allow that breath to soften the tense places in your body. Just give yourself a couple of minutes right now. As much as you can let that tension melt by using the breath to open up space in the tension. And with your exhalations, allow that tension to release as much as possible.
So this is a big antidote to countering anxiety, depression, other negative states in the mind. Letting the body breathe you. So again, we're automatically breathing every moment. We're not aware of that. We don't really breathe properly or fully. If we can start to train ourselves That when tension comes, I breathe. When tension comes, I take a deep breath. Let's begin to institute that as a habit, please. We need that. And just the beginning of the breath, of a full breath, full inhalation, a full exhalation. So I might have one word, breathe. Second word I want to reach for from my toolbox, relax. Now the tension may be there. So I can continue to rotate through I'm having financial problems. I'm worried. I'm having financial problems. I'm having financial problems. To continue to wallow in that rut over and over is not going to help me with my financial problems. It's only going to serve to make me more depressed, more anxious, maybe more unkind to myself. So I've got breathe, relax, number three, I can take control of my mind, my attitude. I am good enough. Just think of that, I am good enough. I am okay, even though I might be having financial problems, even though I might have some self-esteem issues. Well, most humans have them. Even though I suffer from pride, attachment, fear, anger, jealousy, whatever it is, I'm a human being, I'm okay. Why? Because I'm probably doing the best I can with the delusions that human beings have. That's natural for a human being. I've got breathe. Check that you're breathing. Breathing fully, getting oxygen to all the different parts of the body that help you, number two, relax. And both of those things help you to rebalance your mind, to consider, I'm okay. Might be having some challenges right now, and I'm okay. I'm good enough. And from here, let's orient our motivation in a positive way. Because we may be having our level of problems that can be quite serious for some of us, no doubt. But as we were coming on this talk today, I mentioned right now the concerns going on in India and Brazil, two countries that are very toppled right now by the COVID virus, really, really struggling. So imagine you can't breathe. Okay, that's not our situation, I don't think, for anybody here. 
Imagine you're pulling for that inhalation really hard. It's a struggle. You're exhausted. Your loved one brings you to the hospital. What do they tell you? They have no oxygen. That's a pretty serious problem. Is that the situation you're living in right now? So just allowing a broader perspective for our mind that can often keep us from the rut of the ruminating negative mind that is simply easy to go there because the rut is well established. That's all. It's just a habit. I'm now able to create new healthy habits. Even though I still acknowledge my problems and situations and need to deal with them, I can create it with a more positive, healthy perspective. Let's go in that direction. And let's consider directing our minds right now, not only for the next hour, but all the activities of the rest of our day of showing kindness to all living beings, directing something positive to ourselves and others as much as we can, but ultimately reaching a place where we're unlimited and helping all living beings. If you like that idea, take a moment and see if you can set that in your heart. Please relax, and when you're ready, please open your eyes. So another exercise last week I mentioned was to identify, for you to identify your one or two big delusions that you notice in your own mind, okay? Because we're gonna work on some specific antidotes right now. One or two big delusions. So for instance, and I'm just picking on Sarah, Oh, sorry, I was muted. So um, one of the things we wanted to talk about, I mentioned last week, another exercise is I had asked you to identify, begin to identify your one or two big delusions you're noticing that operate in your mind. Because we're gonna work on some specific antidotes to those. One or two, big delusions in your mind. So I'm picking on Sarah because she was so brave to mention when, when people have financial issues, um, a lot of anxiety and depression can get fostered. It's natural. And it certainly can create a low self-esteem issue, right? So that's very healthy to start to be aware, like, wow, I'm really struggling. And this is what pops up. For some people, they may note they have a short temper, you know, the least little thing and they fly off the handle as we say, get angry at someone, get angry at themselves, right? People that are super attached to people and things. And, you know, I, I've treated some people with shopping addictions, believe it or not. You know, we talk about substance abuses 
people have addictions and you, you think of substance abuse, but I had a woman come to an addiction course I led once. Shopping addiction, she had nearly destroyed her family with it. It happens. Some, for some of us, it's pride. For some of us, it's jealousy. You understand? So when you look at those, so I, I want to um, deal with also Sarah, talk to Sarah, is the one thing you want to do is when we look at broader perspective, as I was framing our motivation, can we give ourselves a broader perspective like that? And what happens is actually in, from the book of joy, and that's not pervasively what this course is about, but the lovely Book of Joy I've mentioned through here by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The first pillar of joy, there's eight pillars they identify. You know, these two individuals that have gone through horrendous times of their countries, the incredible suffering, how they come out joyful, how they appear to be quite joyful and what's their, you know, what's the medicine that they take? And they mentioned eight pillars. The first pillar is perspective. So Sarah, something I found helpful is um, right now in the pandemic, first of all, as you know, this is not a normal time. It's, it's not a normal time. We couldn't have predicted this would happen. Nobody knew this was going to happen. And by the way, we're in the second year of it. This is not one year. You know, I, know, I know some people said, oh, well, my kids went back to school now. There's still a pandemic going on. You know, you're still going to the grocery store masked. You're still, you know, the other day I was out with my family um, on a walk and then we had to go in some, I can't remember where we were. We had to go in a building somewhere and, and one, one of them didn't have a mask. She forgot. She goes, oh, it's in my car. But you know, the, her car wasn't, it was, and fortunately I had, a, I had a second mask. Oh, I remember we went to the, um, went to the baseball game the other night, went to see the Phillies, my team. Okay. Not that anyone in New Mexico cares about that, but I happen to care. Okay. Tis the season. So we went in. So I, I happen to bring two masks because sometimes they say, um, you know, you need to change your mask after it was the longest place I'd been with other people in over a year. So I brought a second mask in case I was gonna change my mask, like if my mask wasn't, but anyway, great to have a second mask because my sister-in-law needed it, right? So this is not a normal thing. You gotta wear a mask to a baseball game and in the grocery store and you're washing your hands. I mean, everyone I know, if you, if you go into a parking lot, you look at the cars, that there's their hand sanitizer in the center section, right? Everybody has their hand sanitizer there. So it's not normal. So to have financial difficulties right now, I know so many people going through this. So one way, Sarah, that's helpful, and I'm just picking on you, is, is for me to consider sometimes I'm not the only one going through this. Because when it's just you sitting in the mind and you're having these problems, it feels like you're the only one going through it. And you may know a bunch of other people around you that aren't going through this, but there's a lot of people on the planet having hard financial times right now. It, their businesses have closed. They had to move because their husband's business collapsed and they can't afford the mortgage anymore. I know several people already doing this like that. Over and over, I hear these stories. Right? So the other thing is then it contributes to low self-esteem. But let's think about this. If you're doing everything you can, this tsunami hit the world right now. It's like a tsunami, the pandemic. You can't control yourself in a tsunami. So why is it suddenly that you're not okay, that you're a bad person because you couldn't manage your finances? This is like a tidal wave. Nobody can swim in a tidal wave. It's way over our heads. So the fact that you got tossed off your raft or whatever boat you're in or whatever is completely normal, I would say for this kind of situation. So rather than it affecting me and saying, well, what did I do? I messed up. Well, human beings do mess up. And that's our nature, actually. So the more we can accept that our nature is flawed, that's, that's human nature. Okay, but I'm not, I'm not accepting it in the fact that I'm not good because I'm flawed. I'm accepting it is that that means sometimes I'm going to make mistakes. And some of those mistakes may be bigger mistakes, and they may cause a lot of financial stress to me, that I don't have the money. You know, 
it's come, but I'm still the same person I was before the pandemic when it was, when it was better. I'm still the same person. I'm still an okay person. And you're really a good person because you're Buddha nature. You're really a good person because you're at a Dharma class. You're interested in the Dharma. Honestly, I don't know. You know, I've been around the block a few times this life. It doesn't get any better than that. I don't think it gets any better than that. To have a human life that meets the Dharma. That's considered a precious human rebirth. As you've heard before, a precious human rebirth or perfect human rebirth. That's perfect for the human level. Is a human being who meets and is interested in the Dharma. So one thing, Sarah, I just say is here you are at this class and you got your little doggy there in your lap who's hearing the Dharma. Great imprint for the dog. Um, is you, you turn up and you're turning up here because you want to work with your mind. Most of the planet is not doing that. So meditations, analytical meditations on precious human rebirth, okay, that's an antidote for anxiety and depression. It's a direct antidote for anxiety and depression. And what I mean by that is people say, well, what do I do? How do I meditate on it? The beginning was just a practice of gratitude every morning for the good things you do have okay, and your good qualities. So you might say I'm struggling with low self-esteem, having some financial issues, making me really doubt myself. It's causing me some depression. Yep, and you have many good qualities. Are you giving some airtime to the good qualities? I mean, one, one example I give is you showed up at the class Number two, you have Buddha nature. What that means is you're not a Buddha yet. I can't comment. I don't know your mind, but I'm just saying just having Buddha nature doesn't mean you're a Buddha. It means you have a potential that can ultimately wake up into a fully realized being, a Buddha. So that's number two, good quality you have. Number three, you showed up at a Dharma class. Number four, I see you have a pet. I'm just picking on Sarah, but somebody else had their pet here, Tracy. Okay. And now your pet is wagging his tail. So you're probably a good pet owner, I would think. And, and as a good pet owner, oh my goodness, a pet, owner that, a pet owner that knows the Dharma, right? So you get that, that dog some imprints in the Dharma. That's the best you can do with your pets. You know, the animal kingdom is ruled by ignorance, laziness, sleepiness. They, you know, I, I lived with three cats. I've lived, lived with many pets. As one of my friends will say, I'm still trying to figure out the purpose of cats, okay? But they can hear the Dharma, but they, they don't really, they can't practice Dharma. I know that your pets may be very intelligent. I get that. We have some really intelligent pets. But if I can just have them, you know, hear a teaching or I play a recording for them, walk them around a shrine one time, you're a great pet owner. So I've already identified five things that you're, that you're good quality, but you yourself, each of us has to go through our own trajectory. I go through it every day and that's an antidote that keeps me away from anxiety and depression every day. And if, if you find the mind is falling during the day, headed downhill, can I recall some gratitude and just waking myself up a little, of, okay, wait a minute, I need a little quick dose right now of the good circumstances of my life, you know, well, I have internet, I have electricity. We had a storm the other night, really one of those quick thunderstorms that comes through with, with, you know, sizable hail that rolled through here. And I was in a Zoom meeting with someone. And I remember thinking, um, wow, it, it's really dark out. And uh, the lights flickered. And I just thought, well, I really hope the electricity stays on so I can continue the call. And it did. And I was like, I celebrate that, right? It's, it's, these are things we take for granted all the time. So we have to start reflecting that we have food, that you're not going to a hospital and you can't breathe and they say, you don't have any oxygen. I, I can't even imagine, you know? I saw a quick little news clip. You know, I wanted to cry. These people there holding the hand of their dear mother as she passes away because there's no oxygen at the hospital. They can't help her. They just said, we can't help you. I'm sorry. So there she is out on the street in India. You know, they put her on a stretcher, but there's nothing they can do. So she just passes away there. That's it. 
That's not our situation necessarily. So over and over, we really have to remind ourselves. We have to be friends with each other to remind each other. But precious human rebirth is, so the beginning is just, that's an untraditional way to analyze, to meditate on it. Basic gratitude. And, and really look around your house. I mean, I've, we've been in our homes for a year now, predominantly, right? So people say I'm bored. And I'm, well, I, you know, when I'm in the shower, hot shower, I, I, ha, I don't think I've missed a moment where I'm like, as soon as the hot water comes out, easily comes out, all I do is I turn a knob, hot water comes out. It's not a fancy shower. It's just an ordinary shower. You turn a thing. I'm like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I prefer to bathe in, in warm water. I don't know about the rest of you, you know, unless it's blazingly hot out. But and so I, I'm just there in the shower for a moment, like, thank you. So my mind can't go down because it's like, this is just wonderful. It, it's simple. It, you know, I don't have to make a big deal about it. I'm just noticing that, wow, I have water right out of the tap and all these other things. Okay. And then if you want to meditate, meditate on your dog's life. They have a good life with you, I'm sure. But look at their limitations that you don't have. Look at the limitations they have. And you go, well, they don't have to worry. They worry all the time. You don't know what it's like to be in an animal mind. You have no idea. I've seen cats, you drop a pot from the stove and they're, they run into another room, you know, six feet off the ground. I see them leap, terrified. And for me, I go, oh, I knocked the pot off the stove. I'm not scared. They're terrified. They don't, under, they don't have the understanding. So be your dog for five minutes. And Matt, close your eyes and you walk around in their body. What's it like to lick fur? I find the food, cat food is disgusting to have to eat that. Seriously, but really, be, be, look out through their eyes. You're low to the ground. You don't understand. You want to go outside, but your owner's not taking you out now. You want a treat, but they're not giving you the treat. But, you know, we had cats at Miller Apa Center. They knew where the treats were kept and they would raid the cabinet and go in there and eat the treats. Not okay, right? So we put them in a glass jar. So again, you just see the limit and you really have to be there, but most animals are not our pets. Most animals are in horrible situations. Okay, so this is one antidote to those kind of situations in mind. And I hope that's helpful, Sarah, and for everybody to try to balance. And then the other thing realistically we wanna do, people are having financial issues, okay? So then you need to kind of go into, once you're a little bit, the mind's a little bit more balanced, okay, I need to deal with this. What can you realistically do about it? What, what are the different plans you're gonna do? It could be the PPP loan, an EIDL loan, borrowing from the bank, asking a friend or, or, or a family member for a loan, changing jobs, getting retrained, getting another job, applying for pandemic unemployment or regular unemployment. That's like eight things, something like that. You know, have you, have you taken that tack to find out, to exhaust all those methods? Usually one of those methods will come through. You know, is it paperwork and is it a hassle? Of course it is. Of course it is, you know? It's like, you know, when you say I have to do my taxes, well, you have to do them. It, it's gonna require, you know, some form if you choose to do it. But some of the, that's samsaric life where we just have to get on with the program and do it. And I know some of us are procrastinators and, but let's be realistic. Let's just attend to what do I need to do to get through this? I, and you know what, I'm not sure, so I need to get help. So this is a huge space I learned from living in communities. It's okay to ask for help. In fact, I think it's more positive to ask for help than not to ask for help when you need it. So I lived in a city for years. I was a real city girl. And in cities, you're more anonymous. And people have this idea that they have this independence in cities. Everything's right there, out their door. And when something happens with their power or their apartment, they just call the superintendent and they come and they fix it. But they don't realize that the chain of connection that makes that happen. You know, and one time I was really aware in San Francisco when I lived there is we had this freak windstorm come up. 
And, um, and some of you have ideas, you know, you've been to San Francisco, but 1,000 trees went down in the city in one night during the storm. 1,000 trees. It's a lot of trees for a city. I'm not talking about a forest. I'm talking about a city. So there's Golden Gate Park. There were, you know, there's our natural places in San Francisco. But one of the trees was in our driveway, a huge cedar. And it had been leaning and our neighbor, because, you know, city houses are right next to each other. It happened to be where, one, where our San Francisco center was at the time. It was a private nun's home, but our center was hosted there. And our neighbor the year before had been inquiring to the owner of the house, the tree is leaning and it's kind of headed towards our house. If something happens and it falls over, it's a big tree and our house is here and we want you to get it looked at. And it was looked at and they said, it's great. And then the windstorm came. So the tree fell in a huge way across our driveway for one, blocking our cars. But it fortunately just missed their house by like, a, I think it touched the corner of their house and smashed their new Honda um, Accord in the driveway, smashed it like a cartoon, like tires flattened out and everything right across the engine went. So again, you know, what do you do? And we realized how interconnected, you don't just call, but the power company had to come to, to stop the lines, you know, the power, then the tree company, well, the tree companies were all booked because a thousand trees went down, who you were going to get, who was going to drive you here, what, you know, you had to call the insurance companies, all the lines were booked. So there's a whole chain of how interconnected we are. So ask for help. It's a brilliant thing. People want to help. They're happy to help often. But sometimes we have this idea, I've got to do it all by myself. I'm going to suffer through it alone. I should be able to handle my finances. My family doesn't want to hear about my finances, my problems. You know, I remember going to Vajrapani Institute from the city, from the city where I never had to ask anyone for help. And there was this community and I, I couldn't live there without asking people for help. It was a rural in the Redwoods place. Um, that was the hardest thing for me in the beginning was to learn to ask for help. And then it got easier. And then people were happy and that's how, and there were people there that I helped when they asked me and then they helped me. That's how the world goes around in a harmonious way. The more we build healthy communities like that. And it also keeps things safer because we know each other. We know each other. So Sarah, I don't know if that's helpful or anybody, but we, we've got to try our best like that. And one thing also with perspective, I find financial issues are pretty serious. They can be, okay? But once you think this is not a health-related issue, like you could have a big health-related issue and that suddenly changes your whole financial problem. You know, you go, I still have a financial problem, but wow, if it were a health problem and I suddenly had to go through all these tests and emergency surgery and chemo and who knows what else, that creates a whole other level of problems. So there's always different ways we can look at it. We can look at a situation. So I wanna ask and going back in again with our concerns is so, looking at our one or two major delusions that you're experiencing, and this is, I know, a little revealing for people, but um, name your delusion. And we're gonna look at antidotes, practical antidotes. How do I deal with that delusion? Okay, this is called, and I'll just, I'll just write in there for you first. We've been talking predominantly about fear and anxiety, fear and anxiety and depression. Let's, why don't we look at those? Is that okay? We focus on these a little bit? Okay. The first thing you wanna do is you need to analyze and be clear about what you're talking about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to um, fear, worry, and anxiety. Now, the one thing I wanna say about depression, so many Westerners suffer from depression. So, so many people I know. And there was a Copan course many years ago, the November month-long course at Copan Monastery in Nepal. It's been interrupted, obviously, because of the pandemic. And I was, I was very upset to hear today, kind of worried about 
Um, Rinpoche is in Nepal. That's where he's been for the pandemic, which is his home, even though he's an American citizen. His sister is up on the mountain in the Mount Everest region at Laudo, a remote retreat center. And I was supposed to lead the Laudo pilgrimage first in 2020. We postponed because of the pandemic and then 2021 and we postponed again. So we're hoping to go in 2022 in the spring. And there's information on my website if you're interested to join us. And so they've had very little COVID in the mountains of Nepal in the Mount Everest region. And that's where his sister lives and I'm very close with her. I've done a lot of retreats there and I call her once in a while. They have cell phones up there now. And, and they've said, you know, nobody's sick up there. There's very few people with COVID. They just don't have it in the mountains. And today I read in the news because it's the climbing season now. Nepal opened for the climbing season because they get millions of dollars in visas and things like that. And it's a big part of the economy. So this is the season and people summit Mount Everest, Mount Everest usually in May. So they're up there now and a Norwegian, I think, um, got COVID and then another Sherpa got it as well. So now it's in, in the, what they call the tea lodges in Namche Bazaar, which is a three hour walk from Laudo. And if they get it in that area, they don't have good health care in that area to deal with it. So it's just concerning. And Rinpoche is thinking to go up to do some things in that area. And I don't know what will happen and um, or whether they'll be able to get vaccines up there for people in enough time. So I was I was a bit disturbed because I was concerned about it being coming up there to these remote areas. So when we... Um, have fear and worry and anxiety, the first thing we want to do is start to understand what fear and worry and anxiety is and why we have this fear and worry. Oh, sorry. I know what I was going to add to that. Sorry. Is on another level, what I've noticed with the FPMT website and also all of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's teachings and all of Lama Yeshi's teachings have been kept in what's called the Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive, L-Y-W-A, and you can search online, lywa.org. And it's run by some friends of mine in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And many of you are know about Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. They have a phenomenal amount of incredible resources of teachings of Lama Yeshi, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and you can just sort on subject. And one of the weightiest subjects they have is about depression. So you can read teaching after teaching after teaching, especially Lama, Lama Zopa Rinpoche has more teachings than, uh, than ever on depression and things like that. So you can, um, you can search on that and just, you know, make some time if that's one of the things that, and we're going to talk about depression in, in a little bit. So fear, worry, and anxiety. Okay. Why do I have the fear, the worry, and the anxiety? Let's look at it realistically, is what Buddhism asks, okay? The root of fear, the root of anxiety and worry is a misconception of the self, the I, the, the ego, the sense of myself that I have, and also for a wish for things to be permanent, for things to be permanent. Think about that this week in your own mind. Please think about that in your own mind, okay? So be, from this, from this notion, a misconception of myself, and because I feel like I'm permanent and I don't really change that much, I don't want to change, I don't want anything else to change. So when they do, it's disturbing. You know, and right now with the pandemic, I've heard so many people talk about, you know, when is it going to be over? When, when are things, and I hear people say, when are things going back to normal? I don't even know what normal is, right? I have friends where their businesses, the brick and mortar business is, um, has gone away. They've closed the, you know, several of my friends said, oh no, we've sold that building. We're not going back there. People who are gonna continue to work online. So this is all gonna change. And because people will continue to work online, that's changing a whole lot of other things. For instance, where they eat lunch, 
They're not needing that downtown place to eat lunch because all those offices have cleared out. All that office space is empty. They're not needing people to clean those buildings anymore. You know, the, the trains that take you to those buildings are not getting the ridership on. I mean, it, it, everything is interconnected. Everything's shifting, okay? There will be good that comes out of it. There's already some good that's coming out of it, but we're gonna, so if I can shift my mind to be open to what's going to happen, I have less fear, anxiety, and worry. But if I'm gonna cling to, I needed it to be the way it was, even though the way it was may have made me suffer and I wasn't all that happy with it, but we still cling, don't we? Amazing, okay. So from this misconception of myself, holding myself to be concretely existent for one, never changing, independent of any causes and conditions, from this arises attachment to what I perceive as pleasant or fear from separating from what I perceive as pleasant, right? And I, and I also have a fear of losing what I hold as dear, whether it's a person or a thing. And then my mind also gets out of balance with aversion and fear of the unpleasant, the unwanted experiences. And over and over I go, glomming onto that, grabbing that, and I don't want that. And I want this, and I don't want that. And no peace at all. Just constantly tossed by the waves. Constantly tossed by the waves. So what we want to do, how do we realistically deal with fear, worry, anxiety? Be aware of and acknowledge your fears. By just the basic mindfulness of, that's one of my delusions. I get afraid. So think about samsara, the cyclic existence. Nature is suffering, by the way. As long as I'm in samsara, I'm going to have problems. As long as I'm in samsara, there's going to be problems. Okay. There, there'll be money problems. There'll be health problems. There'll be aging. There'll be confusion and all the other delusions. So just by accepting this a little bit more, okay, but don't forget, don't forget, it's definitely possible to become free from samsara by practicing dharma. Definitely possible to become free, which, which also means, can you please, if you'd like, apply yourself a little bit more to practice, figure out what do I need to do to start a practice? How do I meditate? Is that helpful? Because that helps me look at my mind and simply become friends with your mind and friends with yourself. That's a big source of meditation from there. Okay. And, and let me really analyze what instability and what wave happens to be coming into my mind right now. You know, but I know I can get free of samsara. Okay. And the way I do it is to practice Dharma. So what do I need to do to practice Dharma? You know, what are these courses that took to Norbaling about? Which ones do I need to do? What's the sequence of them? So I can get into a, something where I, where I know now I have a habit, one hour a week, this is what I'm doing. And maybe you see the benefit, so you start expanding it. Maybe it becomes one hour a day. The more you practice, the more benefit you're gonna see. But you have to make the effort. Okay. Number two, antidote, fear and anxiety and worry. Okay. Courage. Okay. This is developed by facing our fears. Okay. You know, understanding exactly what I'm afraid of, what's causing the anxiety, and asking myself, okay, is it reasonable to have this fear? Is it reasonable to have this fear? Do you have money problems in the pandemic? I think that's pretty reasonable. Yep. Okay. And, and the next thing is, but sometimes it's not reasonable. People that have anxiety from a young age, just some karmic setup you've got, came in from another life, I would say. I believe that. I'll give you an example. I worked with a woman at Miller Apa Center. She came on a work study. She was a brilliant gardener. She still is. She's a great person. Brilliant gardener, young woman suffered from a young age of extreme anxiety, extreme anxiety, right? And she knew this. She said, I've had this since I was a kid. So then you ask yourself, and, and it is something about supporting reincarnation, 
to get you into thinking about reincarnation. Because if you notice your siblings were not particularly anxious, but you have this, no, no extra trauma happened to you as a child. You know, and you, you just notice this is just your makeup. Where does it come from? Karmic imprints in your mind. Where do they come from? Previous moments of that consciousness. Where does that come from? Ultimately, past lives. Those imprints are in there and I'm making them now every day. So all I can do right now is take care of the imprints I'm now making. Make better imprints, calmer, more peaceful imprints, more realistic imprints. But I'm a human being and that means I can't do it all the time. My mind gets distracted and bored and tired and lazy. That's natural, but I'm gonna try a little bit in this life. I'm gonna try to improve that much more. Well, good for you, that's great. That's all we can really do. And those of you that are getting more meaning out of this Dharma practice, you might step it up a little bit more and you realize this is really working. This is really working for me. I wanna do more of it then. That was my path. I was a lay person for years practicing. And every time I had these other things and I'd be like, mm, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless Dharma. Oh, I like this. When I'm around this, I'm happier. When I'm around these people, I'm happier when I'm around these cent this center, I'm happier, I'm, I, I like this. So why not go after what makes you happier? Okay, but we, we slowly identify that, okay? So what happened with this young woman is she had unreasonable fears and we worked with it. One morning I meet her in the garden and I could tell when she was gripping, I could tell she was, and I could, you know, and she would talk to me openly. We were kind of really daily working on it. And I said, how's it going? And she'd say, it's not going very well today. I'm, you know, I could see her jaw, you know, clenched and she didn't sleep. And I said, so what, what's, what's happening? I think I've rabies. She announces to me. Okay. That's serious. Were you bitten by an animal? No. She said, okay. That's my understanding. The main way you get rabies, the saliva into an open wound. Okay. From a rabbit animal didn't happen. Did, have you been around anybody's rabbit saliva, person or, or an animal? No, she says. Any open cuts on your body or anything that you've noticed, any infections? No. Okay. How do you get rabies? I asked her. She knew how to get rabies. And I said, so her fear, she, as she started to analyze and talk it out, was unreasonable. She realized, you know, she just, and then she could, she could see it was just imprints in her mind habit in her mind like that over and over. So you want to go in there and look, is it reasonable? Now, you, okay, so then you say, well, I've got a money issue. I got a health issue. Okay, is there anything I can do to prevent this unwanted thing from happening or minimize the chances? Like, like, what do I need to do to take care of it? So money issues, I rattled off like eight different things. So I need to start chipping away going, you have a health issue? Well, I need to sort out what tests I need to do. I need to get the prescription for the test. I need to contact the doctor. I need to make an appointment. All of that is a hassle. I'm aware of that. Part of the Medicaid system in Pennsylvania, it's, you know, a mild nightmare like that. I mean, I just had to get this procedure. And because I wanted to go to the doctor my dad and my brother used, he doesn't accept Medicaid. Because in Pennsylvania, unlike Vermont, where most doctors accept it, they don't get paid, they don't get reimbursed as much. So most of the doctors that I've been around, they don't take it, okay? So you go to what the poor people's doctor, anyway, I'm going to this doctor who's very good. You, have, you just have to really research the doctors to find who accepts it and which hospital systems. And so the, and the, the one I'm going to, it now requires me to have a COVID test before I come into them. My brother's doctor didn't require that. So let, let's say I was a really poor destitute person without a car. I happen to have a car that students offered to me and helped me buy, which was fantastic. So I can take myself to this COVID testing place because I couldn't find a COVID free testing place right near me, walkable to the house, that would get the test done from the time they told me I need to have the test done on this date to when the results would be back, I couldn't find a place that would do it in that amount of time. So I have to go to the place that they're recommending, which is like a journey to town. And if you're a poor person and you have a job and you have to work, and then you have to take an extra 
two hours to get to this place to get this test three days prior to the procedure. I mean, it just doesn't work for, as we know, the system doesn't really work for low income people. Okay. But what you have to do with the medical issues, you've got to do your things and you go through your steps, whatever hassle it is, take the time you're on hold for ages. You get through, they send you the prescription. You never got the prescription. You call them back. They send it again. Okay. You have to do it. So you take care of what you can do and what you can't do, you let it go. You practice letting it go. There's nothing more I can do. I've done everything I could do, you know, and then I just have to learn at this point to accept that I'm always going to have financial issues or this health thing. And I know people, and this is kind of sad in the States, a place that should have the best health care in the world. There's a number of people I know because the system puts you on hold, you have to check with your insurance, you have to get the pre-approval, you have to get the prescription, contact this person. There's people I know that just don't have procedures because they can't deal with it. I get it. I've been there myself where I'm just like too tired to do it. That's why I'm doing it this year. I was supposed to go last year and I just, I couldn't, I was like, forget it. I, I can't really deal with it. Can I wait another year? Okay, fortunately, I think I'm okay. But often that happens for people. So again, can you accept it? There's certain things we can accept. Cultivate taking refuge, the practice of taking refuge to, as an antidote to fear, anxiety, and worry. This will take a little deeper level of study to understand what refuge means. Refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the three jewels of refuge. So it's worth reading those few pages in a simple Lam Rim book, our philosophy. Read a few pages about the qualities of the, like one quality of the Buddha is the Buddha's free of all fear. Well, that sounds pretty good to me. Can you, because if you suffer from anxiety and worry and to not have any fears would be tremendous and they don't have any fears. Another quality of the Buddha is they're omniscient. They're all knowing, right? So if I was all knowing and I'd know like, no, I'm not gonna have any illnesses until I'm 73. I don't need to worry about anything with my health right? Or you would know exactly what to do for your financial issues, what, exactly what kind of vocation to go into, to get retrained or to open the business or not open the business, close the business at this point to save the money. You know exactly what to do or what kind of boss you're going to have in that place. So think of that mind. So is that a, a place where I can seek protection from more suffering, that type of consciousness? Can I find a teacher that's at that level of realization? Can I study the Dharma that is the ultimate release from suffering, especially the teachings on emptiness or the nature of reality? So slowly you'd read those sections and understand more as a deeper, that's where I wanna go when I've got concerns. And even in your mind, you can do it. You wake up in the middle of the night ruminating and I can think of the Buddha Dharma Sangha. I can think of my guru. And that's an easier way for me to go back to sleep. I know I'm taken care of ultimately by the Dharma, right? So slowly we build up that reservoir in our toolbox of the Dharma teaching so that I can call on those and reach for that tool as an antidote before all the other things I do that haven't worked or that create more fear, anxiety, depression. And you can think about the another antidote, the law of karma, cause and, cause and effect. Okay. For, for this young woman that I worked with, she started to get a sense that she simply had karmic imprints of fear, worry, and anxiety from something in the past that happened, past lives. She started to get a sense of reincarnation, realizing her siblings didn't have this. There was nothing that really happened to her. And it must have just been some imprints in there. So it helped her diffuse a bit of the fear. There really wasn't anything solid to it other than what her mind was making out of it over and over and over her mind, making it a bigger rut, bigger thing like that. It's simply because of previous, of actions in previous lifetimes, actions in previous lifetimes. That's why I'm experiencing this more so. That's why you might have a certain fear of dogs or spiders or past life imprint, something like that, like that. And then ultimately we have a fear of death. That's the ultimate one. 
where we don't know what will happen. So for some people, it's helpful to reflect on death every day. And ultimately, when you're a little bit more, you know, more serious student, meditate on the nine point death meditation over and over to familiarize your mind that this is definitely going to happen. It's natural. And I want to go through with as much peace, tranquility as possible. And how am I going to do that? Practice Dharma. I can do it now. I can set these imprints up now. And if the mind really starts ruminating, you wake up in the middle of the night, you, you know, recite some mantras. Recite some mantras, maybe. Just it interrupts the flow of the thought. Oh, money, pemi, oh, money, pemi. You know, just think of the Buddha of compassion in front of you instead. And that's his mantra, Omani Pemi Hong. Omani Pemi Hong. And another thing, lastly, and I know we're near out of time, I want to take any questions, is when your mind gets caught up in the unnecessary worrying, okay? Um, can you keep a balance in life? Can I start to generate, maintain a regular balance? You might need to build up to it, meaning avoid the extremes of excessive worrying on one hand, and utter irresponsibility on another hand. Yeah. If you're really irresponsible with your life and your house and things like that, you may end up with financial problems. I'm not saying that's the only reason at all, but sometimes the people that just don't, they're just not delivering, then the project's not gonna get done after a while. So can I find that balance where I've got to, you know, I'm a little not motivated right now, but I'm gonna do a little bit on this right now. Those are just some general, overall, the antidotes for fear, worry, and anxiety. We didn't get to depression. We're gonna do that next week. Um, questions, please. The name of the booklet. Uh, sorry, which booklet? Can you remind me, Brian? I, I think it was Lama Yeshi. I think it was like either trans, become, transforming your life to a life of happiness or... Oh, the method for the one we just talked about before? Yes. The method for transforming a suffering life. This is just a preliminary practice Rinpoche likes. Um, let me see if I can find the, the link. I think this is the link. So you can download that from our foundation shop at fpmt.org. That's our organization's website, fpmt.org. And um, that's the link there that you can download. I think you make an offering. They don't have written the paper materials anymore. I think they're phasing those out. Uh, it's just a preliminary practice some people do that has a scanning meditation of the Lam Rim, some Lojong mind training verses, and that there's some exercises of blessing the speech. So if anybody's interested in a kind of preliminary practice, Rinpoche really likes people to start with the morning. That's something you can add into your practice to just kind of wake yourself up slowly. It's a 24 page booklet, but initially it's going to be very slowly. It takes a, a, it's very slow going through these. The more you do them, it gets faster. The mantras get faster and it's okay to do them more quickly as long as your mind is focused on it. What else? Any other questions, comments from what we're talking about today? Is this helpful for you? Yes, I have a question. Justin? Yes, um, when anxiety is high and my attachment gets crazy, uh, I find like I'm in a like autopilot and I can tell like, don't do that, but I'm doing it anyway. And I'm like, the good part of me is saying, don't do it. And I'm like, I can't slow my roll. And I then I beat myself up. Because uh, I didn't do right. Yep. So what you want to do is, this is why having a meditation practice on the side 
is so critical because what you do is in the moment, we're habituated. So you just completely blow it. And we've all been there. We all do it. You're not alone. So instead of the beating yourself up, later when I have more time, I can't deal with you. Like here comes somebody really difficult. I can't deal with it or this is happening. Or later I go home and I sit in my comforting space. I sit in my comforting space. My, you have to create that little safe nest for yourself, your little meditation space, whether you sit in a chair, but it, it's different than the sofa. It's different than your bed. You want to create a pocket of positivity there for you, just where you're going to do your work. And you sit down and you go, and you, you know, you go, God, what happened today? It just sucked. I'm sorry. It just really, you know, and I'm going to be there, but I'm gent. I'm just, because now I'm looking at it and you know what? I'm okay. I'm just going to spend a little time and you want to calm yourself down. And so I had some issues with a guy I worked with in a magazine years ago, kind of big lug of a guy, very intimidating to people in the office. I noticed, and I was the new girl and I had to do projects with him. And it was very difficult with him. And so I was new to the Dharma, but what I, I did is I had this little loft in this little tiny room I lived in. There was a built-in loft. And so above my bed, I made this little place and I'd come home from work and I'd be really like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to keep this job. This guy's really difficult, but I'd climb up into the loft and I'd sit there and I didn't know how to meditate. I just sit there first, the breath, a couple minutes, you get the deeper breath, you know, and, and already the day starts to sift away. All those little bubbles just flowing. I'm, I'm here. I am. I'm, I'm just me. I'm fine. You know? slowly go out. And what if it was also, Justin, what if a friend came to you, just like what you just said to me and said, God, I really blew it. And I'm full of anxiety. And this is, you know, what would you say to your friend? That it will pass. Yep. And, and what kind of tone would you have towards your friend? Tone of voice. It would definitely be more kind than I do to myself. Kind and gentle. So isn't it time we started treating ourselves like a good friend? We deserve it. Please. It's time. It's long overdue time. You know, I, like, so just superimpose your friend. Like if this were my friend having this issue, what would I, you know, even notice how, what you'd say to them, how you'd say it. But now I'm sitting in my nice space and, I'm, and now I'm digesting, well, that was really uncomfortable with that guy today. I really almost lost it. And I, he's really, I don't know what I'm going to do with him, right? Slowly. But I start thinking, and then let, let's think about it. And I'd start analyzing, you know, just as I want to be happy, don't want to suffer. He wants that too. And, and do I see a lot of insecurities in him? I have them too. You know, and you know what? I put in nature and so does he. That's three things in common right now with this guy. And due to his insecurities, from what appears, he acts out a bit and intimidates people. But, you know, slow, slowly, but if I can be, if I can start a healthy relationship with him, how am I going to do that? Well, genuine flattery could be something, not false flattery, but meaning, why don't I choose tomorrow when I go in? My exercise is going to be tomorrow. If it happens to be a person making you anxious, let's say, is I'm only going to focus on the positive things about him. Seriously, sincerely focus on, because he had a lot of talents, this guy. There were a lot of positive things. Sometimes the fear and other things, you don't, you don't get to see that. I'm going to fo focus on that. And when I focused on it, I had a moment where I could comment positively to him about it. I really like your shirt, but I mean, you have to really like his shirt. You, you can't say, you can't lie. You have to, you know, and, and suddenly he looks up because a lot of people don't say that to him because they're intimidated. So he's kind of like, huh, something positive from, from her, from Amy. So he's, he takes note of that. And then maybe next week, there's another positive thing for me. Third week, another positive thing. The fourth week, he chewed somebody out in an open air office. And the fourth week he, I happened to be in his office when it happened. And then he said to me privately, I hate when I do that. He feels to reveal to me now, he feels safe with me. 
I, I can't, I, I hate when I do that. And then he, we, he and I start talking, we go out for a cup of coffee private and I'll say to him, so when you do that, do you get any fulfillment or gratification out of that? He'll go, no. And I wonder if you can train yourself not to do that anymore. You know, slowly, suddenly we create relationship, we become friends. Now it's really enjoyable working with him because he's never going to chew me out. So slowly, so we have to do that work. And this is work I did formally on the cushion of analyzing him and, and who he is and what really that he's not that much unlike me or what really happened in the situation that made me anxious and asking yourself again, what can I do about it? These things I can do something about, these things I can't do anything about. I can accept and let them go. Does that make sense? Yes, very much, thank you. So you try, as you, but you've got to get some meditation set up where I'm going to do that work. It's really, really helpful. And honestly, I was doing this. I didn't know how to meditate. I, but it's just your time to kind of digest. Let that gunk flow out of you. Let it go. A lot of it can just go. And, but, you know, I'm just sitting there with myself calmly, breathing, watching my breath. Have a good motivation. Maybe have a dedication. Slowly, we can add some purification practices like Vajrasattva at the end of the day. Really, really helpful because that purifies, that washes away those negative tendencies as well at a deeper level. Any, anything else right now before we conclude? Okay, I think we have one more week on this left. Okay, so please, See if you can get that meditation session set up even briefly for yourself. Work with these antidotes. Please, please work with these antidotes. It's really, really helpful. What I'd like to do in closing is I'd like to dedicate whatever positive energy we've created from this time together. I'd like to invest it in our being able to really use a meditation practice, set something up, don't worry if it's not perfect and you're not the best meditator. We're all in the same boat. You just keep building on it. You keep, you're just watching your mind. That's very positive. And, and analyze your concerns and your fears and your depression. Start to go in there and really look at it. What's really going on? And what can I realistically do about it? What's reasonable to do about it? What can I do anything about? Can I practice letting that go? And let's invest that in our becoming fully enlightened quickly, because as we know, so many beings are needing us. So many beings are suffering. So really for the benefit of all of them, let's dedicate. And all the beings suffering from COVID, may they be healed instantly. And may the countries really having extreme measures now like Brazil and India, may they find more resources quickly and be able to to really stave the, the spread of the virus like that and all over the planet. May people be well. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anil, and thank you, Tupton Norbaling. <laughs>